friend, I want to just invite you to be a part of our magazine family. Prophecy in the News has done a magazine for a number of years. We have thousands of subscribers across uh, the nation and some other parts, parts of the world. This is available. A year subscription is thirty four ninety five, And the reason it's at that price is there is always uh, a special bonus offer. And you can go to our website to see what the current one is. Uh, you call the 800 number on your screen and get the information over the phone. But by paying that, you get 12 editions mailed to your home, plus you get the special bonus offers. If you only want the magazine in an electric form, electronic format and no special offer, it's $24.95 a year. But we would love for you to be part of our family. The magazine always has very timely articles. These are by some of Favorite guests and authors uh, that are a part of us. I always have an article. We have feature articles from the archives of J.R. Church and outstanding articles by Bob Carnuke on archaeology. Hope you'll join our magazine family. Hi, I'm Doug Woodward. Welcome to another episode of Prophecy in the News. I'm sitting in today for Kevin Clarkson. Um, we have two very special guests in our studio today, Dr. Kevin McAfee and Eddie Roush. Uh, Kevin McAfee and I have become friends over the past few months. Uh, Dr. McAfee has uh, produced and directed a number of films. Um, the End of the Spear, for which he's uh, noted, as well as Beyond the Gates of Splendor, and The Last Ounce of Courage. And so all these films have been produced uh, and uh, distributed nationally in many outlets. And, um, and so we are so pleased to have you here today. Uh, Kevin, thank you. And um, and why don't we uh, kind of talk about just a second? Uh, why are you here today? And the reason that you're here is because we're going to be doing a premiere showing uh, at our conference in the summer in June uh, at Colorado Springs, and uh, we're going to uh, get a chance to see a showing of the Samaritan. And so, why don't you talk for a moment about yourself? and uh, kind of where the Samaritan came from, and then kind of explain who this Eddie Roush character is there next sitting to you. Well, I can tell you he's a good friend, and what's exciting is to do a project that's a true story. Yes. Uh, I've always believed in truth beyond imagination that there is, uh, in Hollywood especially, there's so many different films that are made, different projects, and you look and you try to find and seek out projects that have a message or have something that you believe will leave the audience with something that not only inspires them, but makes them a better person. And uh, I've been working for about 10 years as Veritas, and we are transitioning to become the Golden Rule Association. Mm -hmm. We're very excited about this transition, starting this new year, and especially getting to come on television with you and talk about not just uh, what the Golden Rule means to us, uh, because it tr it's an intra-faith message. Mm -hmm. It really communicates to many different people all over the world. We're doing this in association with Dr. Clyde Rivers, who's ambassador at large to Burundi, Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually showed this film first at Disney Studios earlier this year. Mm -hmm. It was very exciting at the Humanitarian uh, Hollywood Awards and the Golden Rule Ambassador Awards. And in there, we had the chance to talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Eddie and I became friends, and uh, literally, this was about almost three decades ago, we started talking about a story that he lived, mm. and he did not want me to make this into mm -hmm. a film. <laughs> right. And uh, in fact, it was just kind of buried, and I kept thinking about it, and a decade would go by, and we would reconnect, and we kept reconnecting, and finally, I said, this is something I feel very strongly we should do. And I talked Eddie reluctantly into telling me about the story and interviewing him and the journey changed my life and I'm hoping that it's gonna touch the people at the conference. Right. I'm so excited to be coming to the conference, mm -hmm. having the chance to be with you, Doug, at your invitation, mm -hmm. and the invitation of this great organization. And I know this, it's something very important to us and something we believe in. Absolutely. Well. We are so pleased to have you. It's uh, an honor for us, and, and I know that everyone that comes to the conference, I should point out that this is not going to be live streamed. You'll need to be there uh, to be able to see the film. It's going to, the film will be distributed nationally in 2017. That's correct. But we're going to get to see a, a premiere screening uh, right. at the conference, and so it's going to be a, a real exciting opportunity uh, for us to do that. So. Um, Eddie, tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll kind of, then we'll kind of get into uh, why it was that you decided to be a Samaritan. <laughs> well, I'm a 
former corporate mergers and acquisitions lawyer. Uh, my father was a missionary, uh, a pastor, so I grew up in the church and rejected daddy's gospel as most preacher's kids do. Mm -hmm. And But it says train up a child in the way he should go and when he grows old he won't depart. And so I'm, I'm really a testimony to my parents' faithfulness uh, to the Lord and praying for the rebellious son uh, <laughs> who, who did in fact return. And uh, but uh, so you're the prodigal son as well as the Samaritan. <laughs> yeah, I wear many hats. Okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, but I was uh, practicing uh, law in Austin, Texas, and my, most of my law practice was f for very high net worth families from mm -hmm. the United States and from Mexico. And uh, um, I experienced uh, and lived a story of a Romanian sailor who jumped ship in the Houston Ship Channel and in November of 1985, and that was a life-changing event both for him and for me. What was going on at that time? Our audience, many of our folks in our audience are older, and they will remember what was happening in Romania, but for the folks that were younger and maybe uh, didn't know what's going on or don't know what was going on at that time, give us a little bit of sense of the political situation at that time. <clears throat> well, historically, Ronald Reagan was in his second term as president of the United States. Um, the United States was in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, it was Reagan versus Gorbachev. Uh, Romania at that time was one of the most repressive communist uh, regimes. It had a brutal dictator named Nicolae Ceausescu. And in the period of November 1985, word was starting to come out of Romania about the persecution of Christians, about the bulldozing of churches, and it was just starting to hit the radar in Washington, D.C. And you said bulldozing of churches. Do you mean that in a literal sense? I mean that literally where the dictator uh, set out to eradicate every church that was not state-authorized, state-approved, mm -hmm. preaching a state message. How did you hear, first hear about this sailor uh, that had jumped ship. It was in Houston, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, how did you hear about that, and why did you decide that you should do something about it? Well, I, I literally was at a fundraiser at my pastor's home uh, on a Friday night, and uh, during the dinner, my pastor comes up to me at my table. There's 50 people there and tells me that he needs me to go next door. Mm. And I went next door, and next door is this Romanian sailor who had made it 150 miles from Houston to Austin, and mm. an incredible chain of events and circumstances that led him mm -hmm. next door. And then how did you learn about his story and his family, and, and what was kind of, as we say today, the ask? Well, you know, two weeks before he had jumped ship, there had been a, a significant incident where a Russian sailor, a Soviet sailor, had uh, jumped ship in New Orleans. It's called the Medved incident. Mm. And the INS returned the Russian sailor to his ship. Mm. So uh, this issue of defection from communist regimes had hit the press and it hit the news. Um, and for uh, me, um, you know, I, I was a history major in college, and so this was all very intriguing and interesting to me. So I, I just had a sense in history what had just happened uh, with a Romanian sailor who had just jumped ship and was sitting across the sofa from me. At the time, uh, because I was representing a lot of um, high net worth families from Mexico, my Spanish was very good. Mm. The Romanian language is a Latin-based dialect, and so I was able to communicate with him uh, w through Spanish phrases that he could understand in, in the Romanian language. That's pretty intriguing. All right, so <clears throat> so he's got a problem, doesn't he? Tell us what his challenge is now. Well, he has, uh, first of all, his first problem is to be granted political asylum and not suffer the same fate as the Russian uh, had suffered a few weeks earlier. And so that required a lot of activity. Uh, I wasn't an immigration lawyer, didn't have a clue. 
didn't know what to do. And uh, but quickly, uh, you know, Einstein says you don't need to know everything. You just need to know where to look it up. And <laughs> and so I literally uh, put him in a hotel, a client's hotel, and went to the University of Texas Law Library and stayed up all night researching, figuring out what to do. Now you have to understand. Uh, in 1985, there were no PCs, um, no smartphones, uh, nothing like that. So literally, no Google. no Google. So literally, my research was through Microfish and reading large, big, thick, giant books. So you're kind of a special kind of person in the sense that I, I have a hard time staying up past about two in the morning, and yet you... You can pull the all-nighter and stay up and do this kind of research. I, I'm nocturnal. I think that was based upon very poor habits as a college student <laughs> pulling all-nighters before final exams. I wasn't sure if it was a spiritual gift or not yes. to be, to I be think nocturnal. Just in bad that, habits. In that sense. All right. So, so you, apparently you discovered something in the course of your research that gave you some sense that there was an opportunity for you to be helpful. There was an opportunity and it was just a God given opportunity because of the alignment of the timing of his defection with history. Mm -hmm. So the INS had a black eye because of the Russian mm -hmm. um, sailor incident, the Medved incident, and the timing was perfect for him to do what he did. Mm -hmm. So literally it's not because of some special set of skills. Sometimes it's not the skill that you have, it's just being available mm -hmm. uh, to help and to serve other people. And, and God has a way of directing your path. Right. Well now, in Washington, D.C., the story doesn't stay in Austin, Texas. There's, uh, first off, there's, uh, I guess, some identification or uh, sort of a set of processes and tasks and things that have to be done. But uh, kind of was the next step to v uh, sort of ferret out uh, what was going on or what needed to happen in Washington? Well, I already knew uh, uh, that um, about Romania from my overnight all-nighter research mm -hmm. and I had discovered during that research process that uh, this issue of the persecution of Christians in Romania had hit the radar of, of a certain group of congressmen in Washington. Uh, one congressman in particular, Chris Smith, had written a bill to suspend most favored nation trading status. And at the time in U.S. history, Romania was the only communist country that enjoyed what's called most favored nation trading status, which put them in a very unique position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union. And, the, and Reagan and Gorbachev played political games with each other as a result of that status. Mm -hmm. And so Paul was granted political asylum, and there was nothing really more for me to do uh, for him and his family uh, in Texas, mm -hmm. I had made a promise to Paul um, that I would go and get his family out of Romania, and mm -hmm. that took me to Washington, D.C. Whatever possessed you to make that kind of a commitment to go basically into one of the harshest communist countries at one of the worst times in the relationship. Here you have Ronald Reagan, the president, very anti-communist, uh, Ceausescu, uh, d probably the worst dictator uh, in the whole communist bloc. So why did you decide to do this? You know, I, I, uh, I, I would say because I have a heart of mercy. I mean, the, the plight of people and those who can't help themselves is something that just touches me deep in my soul. <laughs> and because I'm a man of faith, uh, I was moved to action. Uh, it wasn't uh, a long thought out process. Uh, he asked me to get his family out, and I promised him I would. And, and that, to me, that meant I would do whatever it took. Wow. Well, um, it's going to be a tremendous uh, opportunity to, uh, to see the film, The Samaritan. I've had a chance to see it. Uh, it is absolutely, it is moving. It is motivational. It's inspirational. And uh, to have a chance to have the the producer, the director, uh, Dr. Kevin McAfee, and to have Eddie Roush, who, who happens to be the Samaritan, uh, to have them at the conference is going to be uh, a fantastic opportunity. So we really want you to come. Um, the conference is, is known as the Colorado Springs uh, Prophecy Summit, and uh, it will be held at the Colorado Springs Marriott. It's uh, being held from June the 17th through the 19th. Um, we'd like you to call the number you see on the screen. Uh, registration for the whole conference is $90 per person. 
And also, we have made arrangements for special pricing, uh, which is a considerable discount of, uh, of the room rate for the conference at only $90 a night. And um, so we want to make you aware of that. We don't want you to, uh, to dawdle. We want you to call. We want you to get registered. We think this is going to be a sellout event. And we also want you to get a hold of the people at the Marriott. And when you do, you're going to want to say that you are with the Prophecy in the News Conference. And, uh, and so that way you will get the special rate. Also, I'll mention to you that there will be three special sessions that are in addition to the normal registration. And uh, there'll be two lunches and a dinner. Uh, Bill Salas, good friend, Billy Crone, uh, who's such a prolific writer and speaker. And uh, also an, another gentleman who's become a good friend of mine, Paul McGuire, uh, will all be uh, speaking in those special uh, events. And so we want you to sign up for those as well. So be sure to call in, uh, register, don't delay. Uh, you may miss out. So let's come back. Let's talk. Uh, let me jump in and ask this question. Um, there's this guy named Oliver North. And uh, he's going through some interesting times. Uh, sort of in this era as well with, uh, with Reagan and so forth. I'm not sure exactly if this was before or after the Iran-Contra affair, but uh, tell us a little bit about Ollie North and your, your experience there and how did he help facilitate this process? Well, I, of course, I didn't know Oliver North personally at the time that I embarked on this in adventure, but he was uh, in the Reagan administration in the White House in the uh, NSA, the National Security uh, mm -hmm. Administration. And he, as the story unfolds, um, the defection of Paul Farika crossed his desk and he was well aware of what had happened and, and uh, who I was dealing with. So is this about 1987 or so? This is 1985. This is oh, November. this is 1995. And 1985. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, 1985. Yeah, this is okay. the, uh, Paul, right. Paul jumped ship uh, yeah. two weeks after Medvid and this yeah. is the week before Thanksgiving, November 1985. Wow. Uh, and in less than 30 days, I would be in Romania. All right. And when you got to Romania, this almost becomes like a James Bond spy story. Uh, and, I, and I don't think I'm really trumping it up at all. I think this is really what happened. Describe what happens when you get on the ground and, and what you worry could happen. Well, there was nothing that could prepare you for what I experienced. I, I do recall, you know, I didn't have an iPod then. We had mm -hmm. none of the nice high-tech toys. And uh, I, the, the best technology was a Sony Walkman. And so I had pre-made for myself some cassette tapes. I had one tape that was kind of some rock and roll stuff that would get your blood pumping because uh, I sensed in advance I might need that. Mm -hmm. And then I had another tape that I had made which was Great Hymns of the Church. Mm -hmm. uh, f some of my dad's favorite songs, Amazing Grace, uh, uh, and other other great songs, how great thou art. Uh, I mean, just just hymns. And uh, when I landed on the plane, it was like flying into a, a black and white movie. Mm -hmm. you know, it was snowing, and there were guards lining both sides of the runway with, with machine guns. Were you frightened to death? Yes, I was. All right, so uh, we can't say that you, it's not like you had like a lobotomy or something and you, you had no fear. You actually were fearful. I, I was the last the person on, on the plane. Uh, yeah. I flew in a Pan Am. Pan Am was still in business then. And I was literally the last person on the plane. As a matter of fact, I remember the flight attendant coming to me. I was the last person and telling me that I needed to get off. And I, I do recall distinctly putting my headphones on and putting in a tape and, and listening to the Rolling Stones start me up oh, uh, wow. because I needed to be started up at that point. <laughs> Being a former Microsoft person, that song has special significance to me as well. Uh, so, all right, so y you have to tell us a little bit about this train trip that you took. You go into the hotel and it's just a disaster uh, in terms of what's happening in the hotel. And 
take it from there. The underground church, uh, you know, I uh, there was no communication, so I had had no personal communication with the the Farika family uh, in advance. And but the underground church at that time. Uh, particularly the underground persecuted church was extremely organized. I, I would analogize it to the French resistance in, in World mm -hmm. War II, mm -hmm. a network of Christians who were able to communicate, get information out, and they literally were able to pass me a message, a note, mm -hmm. to let me know where I was to be uh, the next day after I arrived. It was surreal to me. So, so basically, you get into your hotel, you're freezing to death, as I recall from the film, and you get this note, and then all of a sudden you realize you're not going to be able to sleep that night. You've got to go get on a train. Well, I, I, I have less than 24 hours to get to a particular city, a particular address at a particular time. And I had no way of knowing how to get there. I didn't have a no, smart one. No phone, GPS? No GPS, nothing. <laughs> so I, I literally had just checked in. And I went down to the concierge to find out how yeah. I got to a particular city. Yes whether I had to fly, whether I had to take a train. Right. And I learned at that point I had to take a train. Yep. And that in order to get there in the time frame I needed to, I would need to get on a train in the next two hours, literally two hours after I had checked in. That's what I thought. And so, and this wasn't like, uh, I don't know if it was like a three-hour or four-hour train ride, but the way you took the train ride, it was not a straight train ride, was it? The, the, the normal uh, ride from uh, Bucharest to Constanza is, is a seven to eight hour train ride. It took okay. me 16 hours because I kept getting off the train. Yeah. Um, now, why would you get off the train? Well, I it's guess, cold, I, th I, guess I thought I was James Bond. <laughs> so I, I, would, I, I would, you know, I had a sense that I was watched. And so right. I would continually get off the train, take the train going back the other direction until I could tell whether or not anyone was really, you know, just just tailing me. It's maybe I'd seen too many movies. Uh. <laughs> uh, well, it's uh, absolutely. I mean, this is just like uh, it's like uh, that somehow you picked up spy craft from uh, from a movie or a television show or something because you had this sort of sense of how to watch your, you know, watch your back, basically. So, yes. Uh, yeah. So, um, Dr. McAfee, tell us a little bit about as you're learning this story, <laughs> you got to be thinking, man, this, this could really make a good movie, huh? Well, it, not only was it a, a great movie, I felt scared with him telling me about it. And then when we went to Romania and took a film crew mm -hmm. and we saw where he had been, uh, he can't go back to Romania because of the situation, the way that it is. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that in other parts of the world, faith, mm -hmm. and when we talk about faith, it's a, it's a very sensitive issue. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's a lot of persecution of people of faith of different parts of the world. And uh, the bravery uh, of Eddie to go back and try to, to rescue. I'm glad you didn't go too much further because I don't want you all to know the end of the movie. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that, that's not a good idea. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to tell you what happens. But I can tell you this. I was scared even being a part of it. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, my respect for faith and my respect for the Lord and the courage that it took to do this. Uh, it, was a, it was a humbling thing. And I told Eddie after it was, it was over, this is the first movie I've ever felt like I was a part of that I wasn't, I wasn't really guiding it. Mm -hmm. the, the, the film guided itself. Yeah. It was yeah. really a film dedicated to the Lord, to the glory of God. And I'll say this about Eddie. Eddie gave all the intellectual property rights to a nonprofit called Moms Against <coughs> Hunger. Mm -hmm. He did this because in honor of his father, the film is dedicated to his father who was a missionary and a great man of God. Yes. And, you know, I think that the legacy being left here goes back generations of people mm -hmm. who did believe and pray for Eddie and pray for people like me and others that didn't even know existed at that time mm. because they knew that we were going to tell a story that made a difference in right. people's lives. Right. And we're using this film to do private screenings at churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're using this film to uh, tell a parable, a story of, mm -hmm. that Jesus told, yep. and to use the analogy of this even in prophecy in the news so that we can say, you know what, our country's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Doug, you know, we're in a, we're in a bad situation mm -hmm. uh, in the West. And we have got to go back uh, and return back to the Lord. Yes. And, and when we do that, 
it's not just giving that glory to God. It, it's making a difference in people's lives. And I believe that the Samaritan will do that. I hope it will yes. at this conference. Yes. And I know that we're coming to this conference and, and we're coming to the conference so that we can encourage others to say, let's not make America do this. Mm -hmm. Let's don't be a Cold War country. Right, right. Let's be a country that is forward thinking and that is really finding that our foundation is in the Lord. Yeah, now we, we definitely do not want to go there. We definitely don't. Now, the, the story, I won't tell any more of the story or have you tell any more <laughs> of the story, but believe me, we've only really scratched the surface. The, the tension and the, uh, the story itself is just uh, absolutely amazing. And well, let's talk about, uh, certainly the, the film gives us hope, but let's talk about the issue of courage. You know, courage um, to do what you do. Um, I don't know to, to what extent you had to muster courage in yourself to say, you know, this is gonna be challenging and you know, it's kind of like I got to swallow, you know, mm, swallow hard and, and decide I'm going to go do this. Talk about courage and talk about the courage of the Christian church in Romania at this time when they are under so much persecution and the threat of death, frankly. Well, you know, uh, because I'm a man of faith at that point in time, I had experienced a lot of things in my life where, uh, you know, I had trusted God and he had delivered me. You know, it says he knew me before he formed me in my mother's womb. So the things that I was walking into were not a surprise to, to God. And so, you know, you call on him, you ask him for protection and he gives it. And uh, and so but the the people of the persecuted church were people of great faith. Um, you know, what happened in Romania is a type and shadow of where we're headed. If we continue to sit back and let our rights be stripped away, we could end up just like that. But these people um, had incredible faith. Um, uh, they would worship when even the act of worship or attending worship could mean that their life was in jeopardy. Right. Now you had a chance to attend We've got, oh, maybe if you could answer this question in the next 30 seconds or so. You had a chance to speak uh, during this time that you were there. And what was what was that experience like? The Christians that you met and kind of their spirit and so forth. Well, that was a bold, dangerous, uh, <laughs> aggressive, rebellious <laughs> thing for me thing to, to do. do. <laughs> yes, I yeah, had right. um, already accomplished. <laughs> I'd accomplished a part of my mission. And so mm -hmm. I had been asked uh, to deliver a lot of mail and, and, and things to the underground church and, right. to, and to go to encourage these pastors. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a great experience. And I did just that. Yeah. What a story. Wow. Well, we really appreciate you coming and sharing just the, a few highlights of that story. And and uh, Dr. McAfee, we really appreciate the fact Thank that you. you that you made a commitment to uh, to get Eddie to agree to tell this story because <laughs> uh, it is uh, it is a story that that, you know, perhaps uh, excels beyond some of the fiction accounts that we hear in terms yes, of sir. its uh, of its stress, the tension and the courage and the motivation and all that. It's it's fantastic. Well, um, friends, I really encourage you to, again, uh, register for the conference. Uh, we will be showing, in case you missed it, a, uh, a premiere uh, screening of this film. And uh, it will be a highlight of the conference. Again, the conference is in uh, June, June 17th through 19th. Please call on the screen. And we appreciate so much the chance to talk with you and to be with you today. And keep looking up.